one. Uh, this is Golf Grills. Okay, my name is Thurman Simmons. I'm the chairman of the John Shipman Memorial Golf Foundation. And I was the founder of the uh, John Shipman Golf Academy, which was, you know, no, no longer running because our pro, he retired. So we haven't found a pro yet. So we, we kind of just focusing on the foundation now and the work that we're doing with it and promoting the history of John Shipman and who he was and what he did in the world of golf over 100 years ago. Now, a lot of people don't know that John Shipman was the first American golf pro. He was the first African-American golf pro to play in the U.S. Open. And he also played at five US, official U.S. Opens. He played out in Anaromana in uh, Pennsylvania in, in 1920, 1901, 1901, out in Pennsylvania. And there's an article written about that by a, by, by a guy named Bob Denny, D-E-N-N-Y. He talks about Shippen and his brother, Cypress, who was John's assistant when they both went to Anaromana in 1901. So a lot of stuff has gone and transpired over the last 30 years that I've been doing this. And uh, I never thought I would live to see this come out of the shipping legacy, but I'm glad I'm around to see it. And hopefully if people will do the right thing, this will be continued. And you know, the whole world and especially American golfers will know about John Shipman and hopefully, you know, you educate some of the children about golf, the business of golf, because it's more about golf than just playing the game. It's a business, a multi-billion dollar business that we aren't a part of for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to get your foot in the door. So hopefully this will open up some news where people can mentor our golf, our African-American pros or the wannabe pros that can get on the tour. Because that's how you, I mean, you don't have to win major champions to be a pro player. I mean, there's over 200 professional golfers on the tour. None of them, none of them have won a major tournament, but they make millions of dollars doing what they do. You know, they play golf for four days, you know, you don't have to be in the top 10. You can be in the top 20, top 30, top 50 and still do well in golf. But we haven't been nurtured along those lines like we have in other sports. You know, they, they tend to make you think golf is a, an expensive sport. It's expensive once you become a pro because you have to pay your way around the country and the world to get to where you got to go. But to learn the game, you can learn the game of golf with three clubs, a, a putter, a seven iron, and well, two clubs, a putter, a seven iron, and, you know, hopefully a driver. You could play the whole course with that if you were halfway decent golfer. Uh, I was told that by one of John Shippen's last living caddies, a guy named Ralph Wise. So golf is not that a difficult sport. You know, they tend to want to think it is because of Tiger Woods coming along. But like I always tell people, it was, we were playing golf long before we played basketball, baseball, football, and all that other stuff that they want to recognize us for. But they don't want to recognize us for what we've done in golf. And we've done some significant things in golf, meaning here in America, meaning John Shippen and Dr. Horace Grant who invented the golf tee. So, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about golf that, you know, a lot of people just don't want the, the, the correct information out there because it challenges people, you know, about who, what, and when. And in my opinion, all I wanted to do was educate people. I didn't want to, I had no aspirations of running a major golf tournament. And, and I'm not running basically the, uh, the thing that Rocket Mortgage is putting on. They contacted me. I never heard of those guys. 
you know, I don't, I don't even know how they found me, <laughs> but I guess they found me. <laughs> uh, you know, I keep, I keep forgetting to ask them how they found me, but they found me and they found the John Shippen Foundation. And then they, they I mean, because if you go on the internet now, my name is all over the internet with African-American golf with John Shippen and the foundation and the history. Because nobody has actually put the history out there and a lot of people are afraid because they'll be challenged. I'll challenge anyone. I don't care who they are to who he was and what he did. Now, if they got the nerve to come up and challenge me, then I'll just tell, hey, I know who he was. You go check the records and find out who he was. Because the records is there. And I didn't put the records there. The USGA did, the PGA, the people out in uh, Shinnecock over 100 years ago. So because you don't want to accept the fact doesn't mean that we're wrong. You were wrong until you prove otherwise. So we have the documentation to prove what he was, who he was. Everybody trying to say he was an Indian, but his mother was born in Virginia in 1840-something, 1848. His father was born there. He came, his father bounced around the country, Arkansas, Mississippi, Washington, D.C. area. Then he wound up out at Shinnecock, ministering to Shinnecock Indians. The family was out there for a few years. You know, John stayed, they came back to D.C. and did their thing. And John became a professional golfer. There's a guy named Oscar Bunn who was a Native American Shinnecock Indian. And there was some other things written. If you read the article by Bob Denny, he found some information in Temple University's archives about John trying to be some type of, they were trying to say he was some type of Indian. I forget the tribe, but that's not true because John Shippen was nine years old. 12, nine years old, 12 years old when he came to Shinnecock. And he built, he helped build a golf course. And he got the game of golf to the point where he was good at it. He was beating everybody in, in the, in the uh, clubhouse. And they, they, they paid his entry into the, into the official U.S. Open. So the history is there. It's just like anything else in history. They try to deny the facts of who did what, when, and where. But if you look at the old records going back from 1910 going backwards, John's name comes up. His name doesn't come up when you go forward because they don't want his name to come up. <laughs> you know, they want his name to stay buried where he is. You know, if we put a tombstone on John Shippen's grave prior to that from, 18, from 1968 when he died, up until about 10 years ago, there was no marking of John Shippen. Nobody knew where he was, where he was buried. He was buried in Rosedale Cemetery in Linden, New Jersey. We put a tombstone on it, saying who he is and what he was and what he did. So people, when you want to find things like they wanted to find me, they found me. So now, if you want to just keep perpetuating a lie, you can do that. But it's not going to stand up to the truth in the long run. But eventually, the truth the truth rises to the top. Where, you know, the USGA finally gave John Shippen his PGA card in 2009. So now if he wasn't a professional golfer, and if he wasn't an African-American person, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. And if he'd have won the US Open, I mean, I mean, the U.S. Open out in 1896, we'll be having this conversation. He just played that 11th hole, that 11th hole too far to the right. They didn't have Sam wedges back then. And he's played that hole many times, and he just played it too far. So that's why the history was hidden for so many years until I got wind of it, and I like history. So I started doing some digging. Found out, I met people, I met his grandson, I met his two daughters, I met some of his daughter-in-laws out at Shinnecock. Uh, 
what was her name? Alberta, Mabel, Alba, and, uh, Alma, Alberta and Mabel was his sister. People have alternative motives when they, when they want things. I have no motive, alternative motive, other than to make the history right. And uh, to inform and educate people about the history of golf and what we've done. It's not the first time that we've done things in the world that people have tried to discredit us for. And like I told some of in them, they said when I was doing research and checking it out, he, he, he wasn't who, he, who we said he was. Until, you know, you keep doing enough of research, you find out. Number one, you find out where he was born. He wasn't born out in synagogue. So I can be a synagogue Indian. And evidently his mother didn't walk all the way from Long Island to Washington, D.C. to have eight other children because they were born in, in uh, Washington, D.C. area, an area called Anacosta. There was only one shipping child born on the reservation that I know of, and I could be wrong, but one of his uh, one of the one of his uh, relatives named Carrie, C A R R I E. And all the rest of the kids were born here, born in Washington D.C. And there's records of it, and they're all black. That's what the records say. We didn't write them down. <laughs> We, didn't, we weren't keeping records of ourselves back then. So, you know, if you had one eighth of a, one quarter of an ounce of black blood in you, you was black. So now all of a sudden you want to change the, the rules, which you always do. It's just like the things that they're doing down in, in Atlanta, Georgia. In Georgia now, they're trying to change the playing field. They want to make the playing field uneven, which they've always done. And I've... I've gone through enough of historical facts to know that that's what they do. And, you know, I accept the fact that that's what they do. <laughs> but none of, them have, none, of, none of them have come to me and questioned me who, how they, or, or why they're questioning other people. Other pe people can't give them the answers like I can. I, I studied under Dr. Clark for a long time. Look, you know, he was... Where where um where did you study under under Dr. Clark? At a at an organization called ASCOT. You ever heard of them? Mm -mm. Ancient Classical Study of African Culture. They're out of Brooklyn, Harlem, New York, Brooklyn, in that area. Mm. I used to I used to go up to this farm in New York State with a lady who knew Dr. Clark, Dr. Ben. But most of the, I, I was with Dr. Clark. Uh -huh. I know that history is written by people who want you to accept their philosophy and their thought on history. It's not just a, a free for all where everything that they say is a fact. You know, you have to, you have to do some research. That's all I have to say. Yeah. If you um, tell us about who did they. Who back back like 20, 20 30 year, years ago, who did they uh, who did they basically um, quote unquote like recognize as like the first American golf? I don't know if you guys you probably have heard of this book by Pete McDaniel. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. uneven lies. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. he talks about shipping in here. And he he did, he goes all the way back to eighteen nine I mean nineteen thirty three. Jeanette Lewis, uh, James Black, born in nineteen forty two. Ralph Botts in nineteen fifty seven in Washington. Cliff Brown, born in Alabama, nineteen twenty nine. Howard Lefty Brown. Another Pete Brown, they were born in Mississippi. And I'm just giving you the ones who are going way back to the 1930s and 1920s. Lee Elder, he was born in 1934. He didn't get on a tour until 1967. Now, a lot of these other guys prior to Lee Elder, they couldn't even, they didn't even get on a tour. Mm. You know, they just, 
for pros. Well, according to this here, this guy, Ralph Botts, he was on the PGA Tour in 1961. And that's when the clause yeah, was removed. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, the clause was removed in 1950, 60, wasn't it? 61, 60? yeah, 61. Okay. But Charlie, Charlie was the first. Um, so he probably, he probably a couple months after Charlie then. Yeah, Charlie, Charlie Sifford, he played in, He got his PGA card 1959, joined the PGA Tour. Won the Greater Harvard Open in 69, Long Beach 57. So, you know, the thing is that, you know, we've been kept out of history for so long, or we've been misrepresented it represented in history until in golf until Tiger Woods came along. And then, you know, everybody forgot about what everybody else did because it was never mentioned. Mm. You know, for the last 20 some years, this all was Tiger Woods. Like we never did anything in golf. And and that's, that's and, and he doesn't speak about it. Right. I've never heard him say anything in reference to the history that we contribute to the game of golf in this country. I think, like in in his early like career, he he uh, he was because he was in a he was in the documentary, um, uneven fairways. Uh, I think yeah, I think it's uneven fairways. Um, but he speaks on it. But presently, he doesn't really um, you know uh, speak on like the the history and things like that. And I think with the Black Lives Matter thing, he's bringing out a lot of stuff on African Americans in the history of America that's mm -hmm. not been told for a long periods of time. It's like everybody wants a piece of African Americans now. You know, like you guys, okay, what, what, what can we do? But my question is, is how long are you going to sustain this? Mm -hmm. Is this a quick fix? <laughs> or is it just going to be around for 100 years from now? Am I going to be able to read some history or, or, or my grandkids, great grandkids going to be able to read some history about what I'm doing here? Or are you going to turn me into some, some somebody else? You know, because mm. that's what they do. <laughs> Thur Thurman did Thurman. What, who, who's Thurman? What did he do? But see, once you institutionalize stuff, it's hard for them to change it. Right. So, right. you know, that's why my focus was to institutionalize this shipping thing to the point that they couldn't come back and say something negative about it. Uh -huh. That's why they haven't been able to attack me mm. because I've got history that they've written about it over a hundred years ago. And I got dates, 1895, 1900, they talk about John Shipman as a 16, 12 year old boy playing golf. Yeah. Now, where, where were we playing golf back in 1896? Nowhere but out in Shinnecock. <laughs> Period. Uh -huh. And the reason we know that was because the Shinnecock uh -huh. members of the golf course and the golf club, they documented it. The local newspapers documented right in Manhattan. You know, we didn't put it in the newspaper because we didn't have no newspapers that was putting that kind of stuff in it back there in 1896. You know, so, so I'm glad to see that the history is being corrected and hopefully it will stay corrected, you know, because if the right people are putting it in the right places, it will stay corrected and they can't mm -hmm. change. And here we are having a major tournament out in Detroit named after John Shippen. I'm just yeah. hoping that this is not a one-shot deal. And, and Jason and them told me it's not going to be a one-shot deal. It's going to continue. You know, because it has to continue. Because if it doesn't, why are you doing it? Right. You know, if you're not going to follow through 10, 20, 30 years from now, at least institutionalize it, 
you you might as well not even do it because all you're doing is just doing it more harm than good. Mm. So, you know, the people that be that want information out there, they'll go for this. But the people that don't want this information out there, they'll try and bring up everything that they can to discredit. And I've heard a rumor that they are trying to discredit who John Shippen's mother was. Now, to me, what does John Shippen's mother got to do with him mm. playing golf at, at the age of 12, 16 years old? You know? Mm. I mean, he, his mother wasn't the one who, who, who did what she did. They were trying to say that she wasn't who she was. So, you know, I expect that, you know, to come out. You just have to stand your ground and let them prove that you're wrong or they're right. And then they'll start backing off because then they got to go do a whole lot of digging and they may find something else that they don't want to find that we, we don't know. <laughs> so um, can you talk about just, uh, because you, you mentioned learning under Dr. Clark, uh, you, you had also studied under uh, Ivan Van Sertema as well? Yeah, yeah. He mm. used all of those guys were in that group. Van mm. Sertema, Dr. Clark, Dr. Ben, uh, Professor Smalls. They were all teaching at that ASCOT organization, Ancient Classical Study of African Culture. They had schools around Manhattan, Brooklyn, and, you know, I became one of their teachers and you had to go buy books and every Saturday you would go, you know, instruct kids on African culture and what Africans have done mm. to world civilization. Because most people don't know because you have to go back 5,000 years. I mean, you got to go back. You got to look at how they distorted things when they went into Africa burnt all the books, you know, right. so if you don't have no books to document what you did as a people, now the people who burnt them are going to put in the books what they want to put in. And in a, in a hundred years or so, that's going to be the truth. So. You know, it you was to, uh, like, I was, I was um, it's, it's called the, it's, it's, it comes from, uh, museum comes from it, but it's called a mu museum or some museum is spelled differently, but um, it's like having a lot of, you know, books and it was actually a place in Africa. And um, there was like the Great Fire, which that's when they, they burnt down all, all the books. So was it like the library of, of Alexandria? And it was like Alexandria, yeah. That's when they burnt all the books. Alexandria the Great did that. Got it. Okay. So he he was the one who destroyed all the books. It's called the African Mystery Systems. And that was those were the books that were burnt. That and and a whole bunch of other ones mm. about what the Africans had developed in their culture. Mm. Running, they had a whole bunch of stuff. Running water. They had medicine. They had this. You know, they had things that the Europeans did not know about yet. Mm -hmm. So when their own two people came back from Africa and said that Plato's and Socrates, the people in Europe didn't believe it, you know, because they didn't go, they didn't see it, you know. Then you know you got into all these other people that went into Africa, Dr. Livingston and uh, what's the other lady? I forget her name. She went into Africa, and those people stayed there. They didn't. Even, they didn't even want to go back to Europe. They stayed in Africa. They were buried in Africa. Mm. You know, they didn't even go back to Europe to be buried or do anything, you know, because they saw all of what was going on in Africa. The Africans never had to go anywhere for anything. They came here just as explorers, and they didn't stay here. They got on their boat and went back. The Europeans came here and, like, they was amazed at what they even saw here in America. Well, I don't know what it was called back then. It wasn't called America, but uh, they were amazing what they found here with the native people here. 
Columbus didn't know where the hell he was. <laughs> he thought he was on the continent of India. He didn't know where he was. And Queen Isabella, then, you know, they just said, okay, well, you go there and do this and do that. And, and then he went a little further into Central America, South America. And, and that's why the people in South America speak Spanish. They weren't speaking Spanish back then. <laughs> You know, wasn't nobody in South America speaking Spanish. They were native people of that land mass. I met a couple of them in Panama one year. You know, they, they would come into Panama selling their little jewelry and trinkets. But I forget the name of they called themselves, but they weren't what we call Spanish speaking people. Because the Spaniards in Spain don't even associate with the Spanish speaking people in America. Period. Well, it's a different type of Spanish. It's a different culture. Mm. You know, they were, the Spanish speaking people here were enslaved by the Spaniards. <laughs> the Incas wasn't Spanish. <laughs> you know, yeah. you never hear them talk about pyramids that's in Mexico. Why? They done been overgrown with, with vegetation. You can't even see them no more. Mm. They don't talk about the Aztecs, the Mayas. You know, they tend to discredit all of that stuff until you go in and start doing some research and you, you find a whole lot of stuff. If you got the time, you'll find some, you, you'll find out a lot of truth that's been distorted here in, a, in, a, in America and throughout the world, really. So um, can you tell us about how, you know, like you met Ruby and then um, how uh, meeting Ruby, you know, eventually led to like the foundation? Well, me and Ruby were married then, you know. Um, I met Ruby 60 years ago. Wow. As 15 years old. We, we were really together when we were like 15, 16 years old. Wow. Well, that's when I met Ruby. Now, when we got involved with shipping, we had been married a long time. We had children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was in college studying for a degree in liberal arts, majoring in English, literature, creative writing. And she had a history professor named Dr. Hogan. He taught at Union County College in Cranford, New Jersey. And he wanted the town of Scotch Plains to do something to honor or recognize John Shippen because he had been here since 19, late 20s, early 30s. Mm. So wait, Jeremy, the professor, he, he was black? No, no, he was European. Oh, okay. Professor, professor Hogan taught at Union County College in Cranford, New Jersey. Mm. So... He had read a story that Jerry Eisenberger, who then was a syndicated writer for the Newark Star Ledger in New Jersey. He had wrote an article about John Shipley. He wrote it for two years in a row. Nobody picked up on it. Second year, Hogan picked up on it, called the town of Scotch Plains to do something about it. He thought they should. And he told his students, if you go there, and cover this event, you won't have to take my test this week. So my wife was one of his students and that's what she did. And I went there with her and I'm sitting there. I never knew, knew none of these. Only person I knew in that room was Ruby. <laughs> I didn't know none of these other Europeans. It was mostly, it was all Europeans except two people, Bob Lee and this guy named Horace Westbrook. All the best of the people were Europeans. And they had this information that Hogan had given them and they wanted to do something. They wanted to, and so we started our first organization was called the John Shippen African American Commemorative Committee. That's what we were back then. Mm. And we started having golf tournaments. We had golf tournaments, adult golf tournaments for like 20 years. They were always sold out packs. Everybody had a good time. Everybody ate good, got good prizes. And then you know, later on, as the golf went on, the adults start to complain about, about playing on a small golf course because 
Shady Rest is a nine hole golf course, so you had to play it twice. Same hole, they didn't like that. So we had two tournaments outside of Shady Rest. We had one at Shaka Maxson, we had one down in Lakewood, New Jersey. And then they said that they didn't want to play Scott Shields that much anymore. So I said, okay, I'm going to start me a youth golf academy. And that's when I started the John Shipton Youth Golf Academy. And we ran that for 10 years until our pro resigned and went to Florida. That was uh, a year and a half ago. So we haven't had the academy up and going since then. Documentary, um, there was a part in which uh, Lee Elder was, he was honored there. Yeah, he came, yeah, he came to one of our events to fill in as, as the pro for that day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we have that. That's in a tape of place for us. How um how did you get in contact with like Lee Elder and as well as uh, well like, that was this guy named piece? Professor Londino. He knew Rose Elder, and then we got in touch with Rose Elder, and then she was running Lee Elder's appointments then and, and you know she just scheduled for him to come there mm. and we had a second event that he was supposed to come but for some reason the dates got mixed up and we was able to send uh we was able to get renee powell to come mm. out in clearview in ohio yeah so um how did you when when you learned about uh, John Shippen, how did you get like the information about like um, after after learning about him? Like, what did you do in order to to keep getting information about his life? I started researching. I went out to Shinnecock, and I met his his one well, his daughter in laws I think named Alberta Alberta Shippen. Alberta. No, I never even knew her last name. I think it was Alberta. Me and her used to talk every week mm. on the phone. And people would try to go out there and talk to her. And she and I developed a relationship with them. And then I just started reading and doing research and finding magazines, I mean, finding articles that were written in, the, in some of the African-American newspapers and some of the, the European newspapers about John Shippen. And so when I got enough of stuff together from all of that, I made an appointment to go see David Fay. He was the executive director of the USGA back then. Took me two years to get a meeting with him. And after I got the meeting with him, I went up there to see him. I'll never forget that day because it was snowing. It was either in January or December, I went up there to see him. And I told him what I was doing and what I wanted to do. And he said, okay, that's good. Do you play golf? I said, no, I don't play golf. But I like the history of golf. So, you know, when I, I saw an article in the uh, Newark airport about, it was either uh, Arnold Palmer or Jack Nicholas about golf. And I said, that's not right. You know, it's not true. John Sippen was so-and-so and so-and-so. He should be up here. You know, you guys should be saying what he did. But back then, nobody was even talking about John Sippen back in the late eight, 1989, 1990s. They weren't talking about John Sippen. And, you know, I put so much pressure on the USGA that they went up and dug up some archives and they have a traveling exhibit that they have that goes around the country. It has the eight greatest golfers in America in that traveling exhibit. John, out of the eight, John Shippen is number three. And that's an exhibit that they have in their archives in the USGA in Far Hills, New Jersey. So then the PGA started calling me, you know, asking me questions about John Shippen. So they went to, uh, they had one of their conferences and conventions out in New Orleans in 2009. And that's when they gave John Shippen 
his PGA card membership, lifetime membership. Matter of fact, I have to have a a, a framed copy of the of his PGA card right here in my room over here. You see, things like that should be in the Smithsonian in the African American Golf Museum, but I ain't giving it to them because they may put it in the darn archives and leave it there. Bury it instead of putting it out for people to see. Then you know people would know because a lot of people go through that museum. But the part of that museum that is discredited in, in, in reference to golf is that they have a lot of stuff on Tiger Woods, big old picture of him and what he did, but they don't have a picture of a, of the person who was the first American golf pro. So that's how I got involved. And I just just started, you know, having events, talking about it with people, challenging people about it, people telling me I'm crazy and, you know, why are you doing this? And, and I couldn't answer them why. <laughs> you know, people asking me, why are you starting a foundation? I didn't even know why I started a foundation because I'd never even heard of foundations back when I was a young man. And, and, you know, I just said, well, somebody told me we need to do that because <laughs> anybody can run this foundation. I don't have to run it. You know, hopefully somebody will take it over. Maybe my son take it over. But, you know, I'm not looking for anybody to take it over and run it because of the simple fact that I've institutionalized the information. So the information is there. It can never go away. It's out in the web, as they say. It's out in the world. So you punch up my name, Shady Rest, John Shippen. Now if you punch up Rocket Mortgage, you John Shippen's name comes up. So now it's on the pro circuit. So it's at a level where little old me, I couldn't have gotten it to this level on my own because I've been doing this for 30 years. And no, it, it, John Shippen has never resonated out of the state of New Jersey, hardly. So now you got people all the way out in Detroit wanting to do something for John Shippen. And they're saying they want to do and they want to promote the legacy that I started and keep that legacy alive. So this is what they're saying they want to do. Let's see how long they do it. So they sound sincere about what they want to do because we have a whole lot of African-American pros out there that don't have access to even getting on the pro tour. They're good enough, but you need resources. You know, there's a advocates, there's a golf program called Advocates Golf. You ever heard of them? They, they, they run a pro program, that, but it costs money. It costs $400 per event to be registered in, in their golf tournaments. Plus, you got to pay for food. You got to pay this. You got I mean, they've made the game of golf expensive. It just wasn't expensive. They made it that way. I mean, basketball, you can just get a basketball and just bounce around. You can do baseball, football, you know. But golf just seems like, oh, well, you need this, you need this, you need to go to a private club. You need Chi Chi Rocket Drinkers didn't take no golf lessons in no private institution and needed a Lee Trevino. Lee Eldon them didn't take no lessons. They they learned how to play golf being a caddy. That's how John Shippen learned how to play golf. By being a caddy. And he, he caught on to the game so well that Willie Dunn and them start giving him lessons. And then he became so good, they put him in their U.S. Open. So the history is out there now. It's, it's like, what are people like you guys and all the other guys going to do to promote it? Because I'm not going to be around forever. So what happened to it when I'm not here? So we need people, we need young people to come up, you know, step up to the plate. Uh, so it'll go the same way that the jockeys went. Back in the day, we were the jockeys. 
Do you see any African American jockeys now? Nope. And there's a good reason for that. Okay, there's a good reason for that. And, and, and horse racing been around for 150 years, and it's not going nowhere. But you're not going to see no more African American jockeys because once we get this space, that's it. It's done. It's a done deal. You know, that's what that's what's amazing about history. If you don't have people coming along, it's just like a major corporation. Take any major corporation. Take the co company I used to work for, Merkin Company. If there was nothing passed down from the family of Merck to keep this thing going and then get it to the point where it's institutionalized, now anybody can run the company that's qualified. It disappears. You know? It's just like uh, Jack Daniels whiskey. Come to find out, you know, a black man was the one who formulated Jack Daniels whiskey. Now they're trying right. to make a make a Uncle alternate. Uncle Nearest, I think. Yeah, now they're trying to make a, an, an alternate version of his formula. You know, I heard that the other day. Matter of fact, my son told me that. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there that they've manipulated and got rid of and, and said other people done it or did it, but that's history. But if you don't correct and monitor your own history, somebody else will rewrite it and it'll be their history. And your history will not get the credit that's due, no matter how hard you worked at making that history possible. So, I felt I've done my job as far as promoting John Shipping here in the little old town of Scotts Plains, New Jersey. You know, it's done reached out now that if you punch up John Shipping's name, and I don't care if you're in China, it's going to come up. You can be on the moon or Alaska in the, in the rainforest or wherever. If you got a computer and punch up his name, it's coming up and it's going to say who we did and what he did. And that, that's a good thing, you know, because the internet's not going nowhere. It's just going to get bigger and broader and, 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 and it's going to get to the point where people will not be able to, to deny. I mean, there's a lot of mis, mistruths in the internet. You have to be able to, to decipher them and chronologically take the truth out of what they present to you. Uh, if you can't do that, you just lost. Because they'll put anything in a book. You got to be able to decode the book. <laughs> it's like certain books you have to be able to decode in order to understand the book. And if you can't decode the book, you're going to be miseducated. That's what Dr. J.R. Rogers meant when he said the miseducation of the Negro. And that's the worst, that's the, one of the worst things you can have is a, is a miseducated person. Mm. That was uh, Car Carver. Carter G. Carter, Carter G. Yeah, Carter, yeah, Carter yeah. G. Woodson. Carter G. Woodson, yep. Yeah. I got yeah. all his books. I got all his books downstairs. Mm. So, you know, and there's a lot of educated, miseducated, unintelligent Black people that don't know, don't want to know, and ask me why? Why do I want to know? That's what they ask me. Well, why do? You, what difference is that gonna make? I'm not trying to make it any difference. I'm not trying to make a difference. I'm trying to correct some history that would make you intelligent. We got a lot of smart people out here, but they're not intelligent. That's true. Just like how you can have a smart person but have um, the lack of wisdom. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that. And that's that's one of the worst people you could run into. Because mm. as far as they're concerned, you don't. You're not educated. They put more on education than intelligence. And, 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 and most of the people 
who get intelligence are the people that run the world. They hire smart people <laughs> to do things for them. They're, they're intelligent enough to know that this man has an ability in science and can develop something for me. So I'm going to hire this smart person to go along with my intelligence. But I'm going to be the one who might be in control of this intelligence. He's going to do this smart thing. You know? Yeah. No, no, I was saying that's that's true. Definitely true. Yeah, and it's hard to have a conversation with someone that's not intelligent because you'll be constantly arguing with them. I'm not mm -hmm. here to argue with you. It's like I tell people, I'm not, I'm not trying to change you the way you think about life or change the way you you believe. I'm just presenting you some intelligent facts. There's a um there's a quote by Jay-Z that says, um, a wise man told me don't argue with fools because people from a distance can't tell who's who. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's what, uh, uh, I got an article, I think it's from, uh, oh, uh, James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. It says something to that effect. Kids never do what you tell them to do. They do what you, what you imitate to them. Okay. Whatever they see you do, they're going to do. So, and then there's another one that says, I think it's, uh, I don't think who's that by, uh, where it says, oh, Dr. Clark says that I'd rather be with a dumb person than not to be with an intelligent person. As a dumb person, you can teach them something. You can teach them intelligence. Okay, well, for smart people, you can't teach them nothing because they, they're not going to listen. You know, just even if it smacks them in the face, it, it takes a couple of smacks. You know? Right. Right. So th these are things that we're trying to really work on in terms of getting our history. Because especially in golf, that's something that if it, like, I, I think it was, I, I forgot where, where I read, um, but I, I think it, it might have been a course of their own, um, but it was basically saying how the role that Black newspapers played, if it wasn't for those Black newspapers, a lot of golfers, we would not have known about. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Carrier, Amsterdam right. News. Yeah. Those type of, because they were, they were printing stuff that they went, went on what they call the Chittenden circuit back then in golf. So mm -hmm. We weren't allowed to play golf with the Europeans. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it, was, it wasn't permitted, period. Right. You never seen us on any golf courses back in the 20s and 30s. Right. Not run by even the public golf courses, you know? Mm -hmm. So we had our own, we had Shady Rest and that was it. Right, right, right. So that's where the United Negro, the, the UGA, United uh -huh. Golfers Association. Golf Association played their tournaments. They played their tennis matches there. Right. Same right. with Althea Gibson. Althea Gibson was a good golfer. Yeah. She was the first African American woman to play on the LPGA tour. Right. right Why right. ain't somebody doing something about that? Mm. Yeah. There's no, there's, there's, there's none out there now that I know of. I don't know. It could be. I don't know. I don't know there, anything. I think a couple of years back, um, there was a, there was like a PBS uh, feature, and I think it was shown at the Schomburg on Althea Gibson. But um, I, I only got to sort of discussion, which was after. And they had David Dinkins on the panel. Uh, and David Dinkins, you know, he was he was uh, first black man in, in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, he said that where he, the first time he met Althea Gibson was actually in at Shady Rest. 
Yeah, yeah, he played. Yeah, he he's played tennis up at Shady Rest. Mm. W. E. The Boys has been up at Shady Rest. Yeah, yeah, he was he was a member, and he he yeah. spoke at Shady Rest as well, right? Yeah, 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 yep. yeah. Well, um, yeah, that was that was uh, yeah, um, yeah, Althea. That's true, cause I I do know after. After um, she developed a uh, a tennis program, I think it was up in Harlem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's that's really you know all all I know in terms of Althea. But, but yeah, so yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And any any like help like that you need, I mean you know we're we're here. You get me? Like thank you for the contribution like that you've made like to the game of golf like we owe you so much we owe you a whole lot so yeah uh, are you are you haitian yeah 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 yeah, yeah. haitian so haitian I, I back see, i see your, i see your name pierre yeah there's yeah yeah many, there's not too many americans with a name pierre yeah 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 so Either my G, parents G, G, Gene Jean Charles, <laughs> and those names are usually associated with Haitian. Yeah. Haiti. Yeah. My Your parents, parents were they were born there. Yeah. I, I haven't been. I tried to go, but um my mom and my uncle, they weren't, they weren't, and it was also political turmoil at the time. Yeah, so, yeah. Still it still is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Currently it's, it's a lot of lot of stuff going over there, man. Just, yeah, they're trying to get the president dang. out. I think like there were recently there were like five police officers that were killed. Um, recently, because, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, cause I go on I go on the internet and check the news out every now and then. But sometimes, sometimes it's a year old, but you have to punch in mm. current news or today's news, and then they'll show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a magazine called the Haitian Times. And um, they they have you know like up to date information in terms of what, what's going on in in Haiti. It's, it's in Creole. It's in Creole, right? It's in English. Oh, it's in English. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll check it out. Yeah, yeah. Haitian Times, and I, I think uh, like the the founder. I think she's in New York, either New York or New Jersey. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they they have a lot of information. Of just recently. well, you know, uh, New Jersey has a a new attorney general, or uh, Supreme Court something. She's all this, she's Haitian. Mm. Oh yeah, wow! She just got she just got appointed to that position. Wow! Yeah, she's, she's appointed to the Supreme Court of the state of New Jersey. Oh sure. She's, she's Haitian. Wow, uh, that's cool. And and and. and and they didn't publicize that a lot. So a lot of people don't read them, certain things. And you know, they don't read newspapers, they don't read nothing. So they don't know. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Well, yeah. glad to add some, what little bit of information I can to world history and hopefully. You know, this will rise up and educate a lot of people about what hasn't been told, mm -hmm. what, should be, what should be told, and and you know, hopefully, you know, we'll get to where we're trying to go. Right. But uh, I think we've made some good strides in getting there. It's just that. You know, it seems like every time we get to the point where we are ahead of the cart, something happens, we will get cut from under us. Mm. Because when you when you look at when you look at what's happening today, you thought all this stuff was over. But now and, it's it, it's worse. Right. Because so the you thing know, is, you see it played out in institutions. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's institutionalized. Yeah. And see, they institutionalize stuff. We don't. Right, right. So it's just like the, the resurrection, the insertion that happened down in Washington. Mm -hmm. 
That happened back in 1880 something. Same exact thing. Right. right. It, was, it was no different. Mm -hmm. The only different was back then that the president of the United States didn't do nothing because he didn't want another civil war. Mm. And what happened was that they destroyed our institutions that we had back then. Right. Burnt them to the ground. Black Wall Street. Yep. Yeah. Burnt them to the ground. Right. So now when somebody does something like that to you and then the powers that be of the time sanctions it, you got I either gotta get out of here or Cal told you what these people want me to do, or I'm not gonna be around here long. Yeah. So the Amsterdam News ran an article on it two weeks ago. On the um insurrection? They showed, yeah, they showed a picture of it. <laughs> of what happened back in 1800s. Mm. The exact same thing that they did in DC on January 6th. Wow. So Trump just did what he saw happen back in the past. They got away with it back then. Why couldn't, why, why we wouldn't get away with it now? Let's try and see what happens. Right, right. Let's see. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty sad. And it's like, how do you not impeach him after this? Like, now he's... he's well, he can't be impeached now because he's not the president. He can True. be held for crim criminal charges, but I don't even know if those people down in the Southern District of New York going to do anything. They're yeah. the ones who have all... And the people in Georgia, they're the people who have all... Like he tried to circumvent the election. All I wanted was six, one extra vote before I could win. Mm -hmm. Those were his words. Those were his words. Right. Did nobody else say that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you get an opportunity to go to the library and read that first chapter of his book, The Making of Trump. You don't read no other parts of the book because you don't need to. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. Cool. All right. Cool, man. So yeah, we'll we'll definitely be in contact. You know. Okay. All right, man. Okay. Well, nice talking to you. Always good talking with you, man. <laughs> All right. All right. And you, you and you're in you're in New York, right? Yeah, I'm in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I need to come over there to Haiti and find over to Brooklyn and find me some good Haitian food. Oh, I got you, man. I got you. Home home cooked good Haitian yeah. food. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got you. <laughs> That's what I need. Yeah. I've had a, I've had a taste of it. You know, the black rice with the beans. And yeah. The chicken. Yeah. They make potato salad with beets in it. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yep. They, they 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 eat a lot of spinach and rice. Yep. That's what it's Got the legumes. Food. Yeah. That's what it's called? Yeah, legume. Yeah, legume. It's, it's like um a lot of yeah, like spinach and just more like vegetarian based. Like they people do it, put meat in it, but it is like really greeny. So mm -hmm. yeah. We have a Haitian restaurant here in in Elizabeth, but it's more Americanized than anything. Mm. Oh, like a yeah. fusion type. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. 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 But you know, yeah. I I want to come to because I think the most populated people of Haitians is in Brooklyn. I think. I wouldn't be because so there there's there's a part in Brooklyn that's called Little Haiti. Okay. Yeah. And uh, that's like around Notion, like Notion Avenue. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in in Flatbush. But yeah. okay, well we need to. I need to meet you somewhere over there. and We go eat. Cool. I'm I'm with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know they probably got a lot of the restaurants closed now. Yeah, like some some are 
I think it's, it's like probably 50% capacity or something like that. But, but yeah, yeah, that's that's for sure, man. I saw one Haitian food uh, vendor at the uh, African American Day Parade. She had a booth. Mm -hmm. And all she had was she had Haitian food there. Oh, like the patties? No, she had home cooked food. Oh, okay. Like a meal. Yeah, meals. Uh -huh. Yeah, but she this all this was home cooked. Uh -huh. She brought it to the to the you know the festival itself. Mm -hmm. But most Americans, they don't most African Americans, they don't know, they don't know a lot about Haitian people. They know they know about Haiti, but they look they don't speak favorably of Haitian people. I've had a good experience with Haitian people. But yeah. most people Oh, oh, what are you talking about? Them Hades, them Haitians? <laughs> like, they just like you, you big dummy. <laughs> right. Shit. Right, right. Matter of fact, matter of fact, they better than you because they 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 independent. They won they 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 won their independence from the French. We didn't win no independence. We didn't win no independence from Britain and all them people that enslaved us. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll talk. Enjoy the rest of your day, all right? Okay, you too. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.